we really live in God's country. It's beautiful. People sometimes don't believe we're being impacted by climate change. And, I'm, and I tell them, well, if you look up on the mountains and you see all those dead trees, that's a result of climate change. White bark pine has really always been part of our traditional food. Our people traveled over the mountains to hunt bison, probably camped out at the top of the mountain going over. Some of the stories that the elders said is that, you know, they'd just gather some cone, put them by the fire and roast them, and then they would eat the, eat the seeds. All of what we see around us is a cultural resource and, and it's culturally significant to us. Cultural resources are natural resources, they're the same thing. As we were stripped from our cultural ways as Native American people, over time we have really damaged our diets. We don't live off the land anymore like we used to. We have developed sicknesses and health issues since we don't use our traditional foods anymore. All tribes are trying to bring back our cultural ways, our traditional living, and one of the main things is through diet and our health. I am Sheena Shaw Peet, I am Navajo born Shawnee, and I am the reforestation forester for the Confederate Salish Kootenai tribe, and I run the White Bark Pine Restoration Program here for the tribe. Any type of cultural plant or animal that you have, if you lose that, you do lose the language because you no longer have the ability to use that word. If you lose that word, because you no longer use it, it's going to tie in with other stories of creation, with the morals and values that come with our traditional stories and the knowledge that we have. We were one of the first tribes in the United States to develop a climate strategy. White bark pine came higher up on the priority list for us. You just start realizing how, how connected everything is and also how important um, some of these things are like white bark pine in the ecosystem. And you lose one thing and it has like a domino effect that, you know, basically goes down the mountainside. White bark pine is a keystone species. There's over a hundred different species that are relying upon it. If we lose the plant or the species up here on top of the mountain, it's going to have effect with everything down below. As you look around, we have a lot of trees that are dying from white pine blister rust. There's like five to eight percent of white bark pine total of the species that is left. White pine blister rust it is a new disease you can say for our trees because they haven't had enough time to adapt yet. Once it gets inside of the white bark pine though, it's pretty much, it's, it's infected. Once the trees are infected with the blister rust, it makes them more susceptible for a mountain pine beetle to come through and eliminate them out quicker. Climate change has affected the winters here in the area, so we're not having colder winters like we used to in order to kill out the different swarms. But we want to get the seeds from plus trees, which are trees that we are identifying that don't have any type of the blister rust in the tree. So there's a genetic resistance within the white bark pine. We found that there's like a 2% of the species that has the genetic resistance. Our big restoration goal is to seek out these white bark pine trees that are showing the signs of this resistance. We are going to collect the seeds from them to grow seedlings and to consistently plant seed sources for the future. White bark pine cones grow at the top of the tree compared to like other pine cones where it's dispersed throughout. That's why we have to have certified climbers to get to the top. They go out and they find the trees that we have scouted previously that show the genetic traits or resistance and our climbers will climb up to the top. You're pretty good with that? Mm -hmm. Okay, do it then. Oh. I don't know, am I? <laughs> Come on! There it is, perfect shot. Good one. Oh. Is that all right?
We put cages on the cones so that way it protects them from the animals that are trying to come up to get the seeds. We cage them in the spring, we come back in the fall, climb again, collect the cones. We send the seeds from trees that we have collected from our plush trees and from there they're going to grow the seedlings. Overall my goal is to create as many plantations around here across the Crown continent but just around the reservation as well in these high elevation areas to have just different little mini plantations of genetic resistant white bark. It takes two years for seedlings to mature enough to implement into planting. White bark pine takes 60 years for it to mature and to get cones on the top of it. So everything that I'm planting I'll never see in my lifetime and that's fine. And um, I, some will be lucky if you might see some of them but this is mainly for my grandkids, great grandkids, seven generations from now. If you take the time to get to know white bark, you really learn a lot. They've seen a lot of things over time throughout this world and through our histories. Fungus is trying to take it over. Beetles are trying to take it over. Fire tries to smite it out, but it's still here. <laughs> and we'll continue to keep it going. I would like to see a time when we can share the white bark pine seeds again and to have, you know, those celebrations and those feasts. I think it's part of our goal is to be able to bring those back. When we sit down together to share a meal, it connects us to not just the earth, but to each other.